So in downtown Brooklyn, there is a statue of Henry Ward Beecher. He's a big abolitionist, so he's up on a big pedestal. And at his feet are two seemingly larger-than-life-size uh, images of black people. Glenn Ligon is an artist who first met David Hammonds at the Studio Museum in Harlem and later watched him as he made work in the streets of Brooklyn. And what David is doing is putting a scarf around the neck of one of those figures at the base of the Beecher statue because it's in the middle of a blizzard. So he is literally putting a scarf around this black woman's neck and head to keep her from catching cold. The scene that Glenn is describing is from a short video made in 2007. It's not like he thought, like, let me wait for a snowstorm and then I'll go out to Cadman Plaza and put, you know, it just feels like, oh, it's snowing. I'm going to go do something out of that stuff, you know? <laughs> and, you know, call up a friend and it's like, come on, come videotape this, you know? It has that feeling, you know, like like all of his work, not premeditated. It just feels like it's responding to a moment. David has often used modest gestures to ask big questions. Art historian Kelly Jones. I think he's still pointing out the kind of inequities, not just in our country, but also just in our visual culture. White men get pedestals. Black folks get the base. (laughs) They get to be on the ground, looking up adoringly at their saviors, you know. But it's also a kind of, like, acknowledgement that the past is sort of present, you know. This image of this Black girl is present for him and needs taking care of. And so this gesture of putting a scarf around her neck in the snowstorm is, is that. Hammonds has really been engaged with these ideas of representation, how people of color are represented, and how you can intercede in these, you know, kind of canonical visual structures, and particularly in public space. Welcome to Artists Among Us, a podcast from the Whitney Museum of American Art. In this season, We've been looking at the ways that David Hammond's sculpture Days In opens up new perspectives on this site. In this episode, we come back to the sculpture itself, how it makes its meaning, and how it fits into the world around it right now. It's really impressive to see how Hammond's has really engaged this idea of monuments over time. Uh, to the point that, you know, last week we saw all these monuments just falling or being taken down. Our interview with the art historian Kelly Jones happened in June 2020. By that time, as many of you know, George Floyd had been murdered by the Minneapolis police. This resulted in unprecedented uprisings, rebellions, demonstrations all over the country. In any number of cases, protests were targeting the symbols of white supremacy itself, the monuments, monuments that existed around the country that needed to be re-examined, understood, and perhaps even removed. As Kelly Jones points out, David had already dealt with these issues, the issues of monuments and the problem of monuments in his earlier work. What Public Enemy is, it's part of the show Dislocations at the Museum of Modern Art in 1991 and 92, installations by seven artists curated by Robert Storr. According to MoMA, dislocations leads us to question some of the familiar mental landmarks by which we orient our thinking. Hammond's piece is called Public Enemy, and he creates this kind of three-dimensional photo mural. It's really like a box with photos of the sculpture from all angles, or at least from four angles. Curator Tom Finkelpearl. 
They took four photographs of the sculpture that's in front of the Museum of Natural History, which is of Teddy Roosevelt. And on either side of Teddy Roosevelt is an African... It's meant to represent the continent of Africa and the continent of the Americas. So it's a black figure and a Native American figure. He creates a box, puts it in uh, the Museum of Modern Art, and then hides it in some ways behind sandbags, police lines, and he creates, recreates in some ways, this uh, famous sculpture of Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States, previously a governor of New York, which sits outside of the American Museum of Natural History. Mabel Wilson is a professor at Columbia University and an architect. And so there he is, you know, broad-chested, reining his horse. And on one side is an indigenous person with the rifle down. And then on the other side is an African with the rifle up. And so it's clearly a narrative of conquest, the conquest of civilization. Again, we see, you know, the kind of white figure that is on high and the figures of color who are lower than, right? And of course, you know, from art history theorizations, formal analysis, the white male is at the apex (laughs) of, of the whole thing. The sculpture was somewhat disorienting. Its center was a large box depicting images of monuments with police barricades and balloons surrounding it. It was both celebratory and ominous, messy and unclear. I think the Hammonds piece is really sort of pointing out these stakes of, like, we don't live in a public sphere that's in fact about the representation per se of freedom and equality, right? It speaks to freedom and equality for some, and then speaks about your inferiority and your absence of rights in the public sphere. So what David did in that environment was then surround that big, huge photograph, which was in the middle of the room with sandbags and then as if it is sort of like a war going on, which there there kind of is around that sculpture. And then um, they're kind of balloons. There is, you know, this kind of posture of defense that's clearly around protecting it, you know, could be one version. You know, there's the sort of celebration and streamers around it. As if there's a party going on. I think that the Hammonds work, in my mind, it sort of speaks to uh, the entrenchment, actually, of that white supremacy and the protection of those representations in the public sphere, because they become so commonsensical that, like, how could you not see the beauty? How could you not see Roosevelt as a great man? You know, how can you not, you know, sort of celebrate this as our shared set of values of what it means to be an American without understanding so how deeply embedded racialization is, even, I would say, in the category of the aesthetic. The fact that it is called public enemy, he's saying that the enemy is really the kind of imperialist figure in Roosevelt. Uh, But of course, Public Enemy is, a, at that point, a well-known hip-hop band, and kind of reusing that term, because Black people, people of color, are always seen as the public enemy. The notion that even, like, even speaking and pointing out the problematic nature of those kinds of representations, the the fact that we actually do live in a highly racialized, racist society, you then become an enemy. You become the enemy. You become the problem. You become the racist. And it's, it's exactly the logic. That is domination. That is how you dominate someone, right? That you're always flipping the script. You're always changing the narrative. It's bullying essentially, but that's what domination does to the point there's no way to move. It's a kind of psychic violence so that you have no way to turn. There's a certain ambivalence there that you're really not sure what the quote unquote message is. It's not like he has 
you know, text that says, oh, you know, I can't stand Theodore Roosevelt. No. And then there's balloons. There's other things. So you don't know if it's a celebration. It's a demonstration. It's, it's kind of unclear, but he leaves it up to the audience. He's not going to tell you what these things are. He's going to listen to see what you have to say about it. What do you see? How, do you, how does this make you feel? Right. And I, I would say that even if with our 2020 vision, we can look and see, wow, how amazing that he's been engaging monuments. And this is something that we're engaging right now. The subtleness and the kind of sideways approach to these type of ideas. I would say along with the question of aesthetics, form, the language of form, the work that monuments, I think, in the West do, or express power. Um, they mark time, they mark place, they often um, are material and linguistic expressions of a set of values of a group of people at a moment in time. You know, one of the challenges is how long does that, the interpretation of that meaning essentially last over time. And, and I do think there's a way, you know, and this is the kind of way in which how we think about knowledge in the past and history in the West, it's its timeless, it's universal, and so built into our way of knowing the world is this belief, well, the, all of the world is that way. And a monument suggests something that is out of time. It's something that is beyond time. Adam Weinberg is the Whitney's director. Recently, a lot of artists have been questioning the notion of a monument. There's An Millet, for example, is one artist who comes to mind who was in a recent Whitney Biennial. And um, the artist Ken Lam uh, has also been focusing on this. He's been known for exploring the concept of monuments and he's co-founded an organization, um, I guess it's sort of a think tank called the Monument Lab. We speculate on uh, future monuments. Um, at the same time, we uh, study the uh, behavior of monuments, the, our expectations of monuments, uh, the iconography of monuments, and we ultimately try to uh, unfix uh, the kind of fixed notions we have of uh, monuments. I was new to Philadelphia in 2012, and I was walking around this city, and I, I started noticing this kind of um, very um, uneven, uh, you know, inventory of monuments. Right, Philadelphia has over a thousand uh, statues, for example, and. Uh, not until 2017 was there a full-size historical uh, African-American figure that was officially sanctioned. And that's, you know, Philadelphia is 40% African-American. You know, this is a city of uh, Marianne Anderson, Billie Holiday, uh, John Coltrane, you know, you, you name it. There's a lot of incredible figures here, and yet, yet none of them have uh, statues that, that uh, memorialize them. Where a light bulb kind of hit my head was the Rocky Balboa statue, which is obviously a fictional character from the movie Rocky. It, uh, you know, graces a very hallowed site at the base of the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. But Philadelphia is also home to a real heavyweight champion, Joe Frazier, who beat Muhammad Ali in, in you know, some brutal fights, uh, you know, decades ago, and and yet. To this day, there's no officially sanctioned statue of Joe Frazier in, in Philadelphia. There's no public memorialization of a true heavyweight champion, but there is one of a fictional one who's white. I, there's lots of stories like that. The, I mean, the critique of monuments, it's, it's about the kind of crisis of representation. You know, what can we believe in? What can we not believe in? David always believes that that works that artworks are multivalent, that they don't have singular readings. He does not want to tell people what to believe, either um, in verbally or through the work itself. So he's always leaving things open, and it, and and the notion of his work is always about questioning rather than making declarative statements. He never explains the, um, why he decided to take on the Roosevelt Monument, but he is always thinking about the positioning of the public artworks in relationship to public institutions. 
Um, that's something that's not uncommon is the notion of how art enters the public sphere. In Public Enemy, David did take aim at the Roosevelt Monument's overt racism. But in retrospect, I think that there was much more to it than that. Maybe that crazy, awkward party celebrated the end of all those ideas wrapped up in the European tradition of monuments, that timelessness, that universality, that sense of victory that was all an illusion. I mean, I have a, a, a problem with monuments in general. I think that um, uh, monuments tend to uh, uh, simplify things and essentializing something. They're kind of uh, meant to fail in a way because probably they will speak and inspire some people, but I don't think that it, it, it speaks to all people, always. I thought the Statue of Liberty would speak to all people and obviously it's not. Uh, so, so I think that that uh, um, the notion of monuments are efforts that are probably set to fail. They're corny, they're reductive. Someone will hate them. Adam Weinberg. Around the time of uh, Trump's election, uh, uh, artist An Mile took some incredible photographs of Confederate monuments and uh, and often in um, after they'd been removed from their original site in storage facilities. She was working in New Orleans at the time when all the Robert E. Lee and many of the other Confederate statues were being taken down. So it's that sense of displacement and the notion of what what is there to represent and how are we represented in the public sphere. It's very different than David's work itself, but where, where they coincide is with the notion of questioning. Questioning is what is public art? The monuments came down and they were at first done very uh, secretly and mysteriously at night. Uh, um, unmarked vans were used, uh, the date was never posted. I was uh, teaching at the time, and so it was always very difficult to plan the timing and be there when it happened. And, and uh, even though I tried multiple times, I basically missed the removal of Beauregard and, and Robert Ely and General Davies. But I persisted, and so uh, eventually, in the summer of 2016, uh, I was able to gain access to the um, Homeland Security storage where those monuments were actually kept. And, and it, it was actually so much more interesting, to tell you the truth, to see those monuments enormous being kept in something so simple as plywood storage in one case and, and something much more industrial in another case. So I was able to photograph Robert e. Lee and Beauregard in one plywood storage and uh, Davies was in another industrial storage. It is so clarifying to see them away from the pedestal being kept and stored just like anything else. Their monumentality is still ever present. What do we put out in the public sphere to represent um, um, history? What is history itself? Who tells history? Who owns history? Um, those are the kinds of questions that on me and David are both uh, 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 both addressing from radically different perspectives with radically different means. And days in, David makes a kind of counter narrative, a counter proposal, a totally different model for using public sculpture to embody communal meaning. When I asked him in a meeting years ago, is it a monument? I said, it's really sort of an anti-monument in a way. As a reminder, the sculpture started as a sketch, an outline of the building that rested on Pier 52 across the West Side Highway from the Whitney. That sketch has finally been transformed into a work of sculpture, massive but without volume. G. Nortonson is the structural engineer who oversaw the construction of Day's Inn. It's so mysterious. You know, what the heck is this thing? You know, my hope and what I've tried really hard to um, achieve on our end is that every piece of it is really, really skinny, barely there, so that the spirit, the ghost-like quality of it, hopefully, will be very clear. For me, I think 
I think as a photographer, the way to access history is to be specific, to uh, describe things in details, to really go in there and dig deep and uh, try to be certain I know what I'm talking about. Day's End is extraordinary in the sense that it, it's so minimal and it's a skeleton. Um, it, it has no details except the structure, the shape of the building. What is it? It is a description in space. It is a drawing in space. It is an implied volume by the simplest and smallest number of linear elements that gives you the impression of a very large warehouse space. Yet nothing is actually enclosed except air. Somehow it succeeds even more so because we don't notice it in a funny way, right? Uh, until, until you kind of walk away from it. Mabel Wilson is a professor at Columbia University and an architect. I think it marks time and space in a very kind of light way. It's very ephemeral and fleeting. And that's, that's more of a counter monument than it is within the idiom and the language of the Western monument. Architect Catherine Sivik worked closely with Guy. I guess for me, that word monument, it always just sounds really heavy. Like it's made out of bronze or stone or it has a lot of self-weight. So it's interesting to think about this piece as a monument because it's truly so ephemeral and light and, and really almost, it almost floats, right? It seems to be almost in defiance of gravity and that heaviness that we so often associate with the word monument. Monuments are often so specific also. They're about a very particular date in history or about a very specific event, and they tend to mark that place or that person or that date. And I think what's profound is to not have all of those singular associations. As opposed to being totally specific, it actually opens it up to being completely indeterminate, more than even a counter proposal. It's a contrarian position that says it's not about this. It's not about one single thing, but it's about an infinite number of things, possibly. So I think there's something very comforting about this thing, this presence of this ghost of the past that rings back another time, but it's also looking forward. So it's not nostalgic in many ways. I think the sort of here and there-ness, you know, here and there-ness in the sense of like here but not here at the same time is a lot of what David's work is about, you know. David making things that have this enormous presence but are also kind of like ghostly, they're not here. Days In doesn't have one story to tell or any single history to celebrate. It's an absence, a frame of a building that no longer exists. But it's so rooted in its site, at the meeting point of the city and the river, that we might also see that absence as an opening, a space for the many absences and invisible histories of this place to speak. Professor Kelly Jones. I think with this piece and with some of these others, it's really about meditating on that absence, on that invisibility. Is it an invisibility of people, of housing, you know, of certainly thinking about Native American sovereignty in those spaces? That kind of empty framework makes us think about what was there, not just last week, not just 10 years ago, but generations ago, before New York. And the fact that it's empty and there's just a framework really, I think, takes us to that place of kind of starting over. In the ruins of, of the past comes the seeds of the future, like literally seeds coming everywhere. Filmmaker Elegance Bratton. 
So when I walk through this space, I think about, you know, the people who've been lost to time in this space. Activist Stephanie Rivera. And that's that's going to bring a lot of feelings for a lot of people that were from over here, that were that got to be here and got to experience it. Um, I think sometimes we don't give enough credit to like landmarks that existed. And I think it's important that we, you know, try to hold on to a little bit of that before it's all completely gone. So those spaces, you know, have their own, you know, they have their own memory. Professor Mabel Wilson. And so the piece sort of feels like just a brief glimmer outlined of what, what happened there, but just a very faint marking, not a reconstruction, not a recreation, but a kind of marking of what, what happened there. You don't have to read the Encyclopedia Britannica to learn about the history of this place. If you can open yourself, it comes to you. Activist Curtis Zanica. And don't let the Encyclopedia Britannica or Wikipedia tell you that we are no longer here. Artist Glenn Ligon. I think David's aware of the history of this site, you know, and what it was and what it is now. And his project is a kind of, you know, it's about a ghost, you know. It's like any urban space changes over time, but the ghost of what it was is still there. And I think that's what he's doing in this project, is, is making the ghost visible. for being with us for this last episode of our five-part series. Artists Among Us is a podcast from the Whitney Museum of American Art. If you're downtown near the Whitney and the High Line, come see the sculpture that inspired the series, David Hammonds's Day's End. To learn more about the voices you've heard here, please visit whitney.org slash podcast. You'll also find Artists Among Us wherever you get your podcasts. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate the show and share it with your friends. Special thanks to the artist David Hammonds, whose vision made this project possible. And thank you to our host, artist Carrie Mae Weems. Thank you to the City of New York, the Keith Haring Foundation, Lori M. Tisch Illumination Fund, and Robert W. Wilson Charitable Trust, and the many donors for their generous support to realize David Hammonds' day's end. And a special thanks to the Joan Gans Cooney and Holly Peterson Foundation and the Marlene Nathan Meyerson Family Foundation for their support towards the creation of this podcast, Artists Among Us. Additional thanks to our podcast contributors, Kelly Jones, Tom Finkelpearl, Mabel Wilson, Adam Weinberg, Ken Lum, Anmi Lay, Guy Nordenson, Catherine Sievit, Andrew Berman, Elegance Bratton, Stephanie Rivera, Curtis Zuniga, and Glenn Ligon. Special thanks also to Kyle Croft, Alex Fialo, George Kamensky, Jonathan Kuhn, Gina Morrow, El Nicochea, Sofia Ortega Guerrero, Eliza Senna, Stephen Vider, Sasha Wurzel, and Liza Zapol, as well as Jackie Foster, Catherine Potts, and Helena Gusick. Original music for Artists Among Us and Days End was created by Daniel Carter and his collaborators. This podcast was produced by Sound Made Public with Tanya Katendian, Katie McCutcheon, Jeremiah Moore, Mawena Tendar, and Philip Wood. It was produced in collaboration with the Whitney Museum of American Art, including Anne Bird and Emma Quaitman.